Hi, hello, and welcome to the July 2022 Out of the Vault announcement. I am your channel manager and host, Steve Kaufman, and joining me at this time, he is an author, he is an actor, he is a TV producer slash host, and most recently, he is a brand new podcaster. He is Mr. Sean Oliver. How are you, man? Living the credo that you don't have to be one thing. <laughs> Which is funny. There's always that, like, jack of all trades, master of nothing threat. It's a, but if you can make a living as a jack of all trades and a master of none, who, who we're all out here trying to make a living is how I've always seen it. It's all about the money. Steve Kaufman told me that uh, <laughs> at one point. It's all about the money. And actually, it, that, that was something – that was a quote from one Kevin Nash – who, when I believe you were talking about how he was almost Sabretooth in the X-Men movie in the late 90s, and, but they wanted to take him away for SAG minimum, but take him away from his WCW contract, <laughs> to which he said, I'll be the janitor for a million dollars, I believe was the exact quote. Yeah, I think he also quoted somebody else that the only, the only two re things that are real are the money and the miles, right? Who, who was the original quote? Was it, uh, I think somebody imparted that wisdom to him. Uh, let's let's see if anyone in the chat will let us know. Yeah, let, you guys help, that? Us, help us quote that wisdom. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I want to say Lou Albano. I just always want to say Lou Albano. That feels right, but right. it's probably Lou Albano. Who, who had oh. the best tits in wrestling? Lou Albano. <laughs> Funky right, Boy. So Funky Boy has confirmed. Funky Boy, B40, right. B40. <clears throat> Actually, oh, Sylvan Spectre with an Elvis avatar. Lou Albano, lots of Lou Albano. Yeah. That, have you seen that movie? Have you seen the Elvis movie? Yet? I have seen the Elvis movie. I loved it so much. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Um, it's worth a trip to the theater. It is definitely worth a trip to the theater. I don't I don't think in your living room it'll play just as, as well as it played in an actual theater. That Elvis movie. Uh, somebody saying Chief J. Strongbow. A lot of Lou Albano. Somebody said, I thought it was Rick Rude. Someone in the comments will be the solidifier of when exactly it was said. It's a pretty common quote as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with the Lou Albano team here on the stream. So okay, I'm, I'm also on the Lou Albano team. And speaking of the stream, we are streaming live here at YouTube.com/slash KC Vault. And for those who don't know, because I see the comments, a lot of you may not be aware, the way this channel works is we have the entire library up and available at kcvault.pivotshare.com. It's right below us. It's not the, the entire library. Oh, sorry. It's almost the entire almost library. Almost the entire library. It what is it missing? It will be the entire library. Well, there's legalities that you okay. have to work out and whatnot. So. Okay. I didn't know that. Is is there anything on that library that – or is there anything not on that library that was on the hard drive y'all sent me two summers ago? Um, yes. Yeah, so our fans here at the uh, – out of the vault – um, got some shows. Don't make me remember which ones. Okay, fair uh, enough. That, that we hadn't had clearance for the subscription channel yet, but uh, but it's all coming. It's just stuff that takes time, and um, rather than cycle stuff in and out, we try to uh, we just want to get everything up in 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 its entirety. And uh, but the great thing here is, if you're a subscriber to the Out of the Vault channel. You get a handful of shows every month. They do cycle. I see people in the comments that are sometimes going, "Hey, where, where's the, you know, where's the Kevin Nash uh, timeline?" And well, if that had its month run, brother, then it <laughs> uh, then it maybe got sent to a different territory for a while, like back right. then. But there's always there's always new ones coming in. So it's a cycling, yeah, yeah. Uh, sampling of of what we have at the KC Vault. So you first should click subscribe to this right here. And uh, and then run over to kcvault.pivotchair.com. You can actually just type kfabecommentaries.com, and it'll get you there. Um, and then uh, sign up for our subscription service where you can watch this stuff again and again and again. And it does not cycle out. It is yours to stream uh, forever as long as you have the, uh, the, the subscription. And listen, even Netflix can't say that. There's shit that drops off of that all the time. Right, so like we're, we're, all those we're, Disney, all those Disney, sh or all those Marvel shows on Netflix. That right, there were there was like the, they weren't treated as canon. There was like a Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then there was a Netflix show Marvel Cinematic Universe because it was a weird thing. But now they're all on Disney Plus, so they they're more of a shared canon. Exactly. 
Right. We none of that. None of that at K, at kfabecommentaries.com, which right. reroutes you to kcvault.pivotchair.com, which is a mouthful. Thank you for right. that. Exactly. And listen, if I had to name the company again, you know, you know, <laughs> how, you know, on technical support, when I'm on the phone in the past trying to get our website straightened out, and they patch me into Chennai, India, and I'm telling them, yes, the email address is info at kfabecommentaries.com. That alone was 11 minutes to just get them <laughs> get that email written down. I it's would have info. called it caseyvault.com or something like that. It's info as in info and Salvatore Martone. We're starting a cycle, brother. We're in the we're in the we're in the YouTube territory. I think would be the best way to describe it. So these right. these clips that were these clips, these shows that we're going to talk about today are making their way through the YouTube territory in July of 2022. And they're going to spend four weeks in the territory, and then they're going to move on to the paywall territory, if you will. And there are a couple different paywall territories. And How would the fans – listen, for you guys, let's ask the public, Steve, uh, a discussion that we've had. We can let them inside, right, Steve? We can. Please, can we? Okay. <laughs> so what if the subscription service, The Vault, was entirely managed by YouTube? So the subscription service – not talking about this – Free. We will still give you free samples, uh, free programs every month here on the out of the vault. But what if the actual vault um, went to YouTube? Would it be easier for you guys to watch on your television? Um, I know that's always an issue people talk about with Pivot Share. Um, the developers promised me for three years that we were we were going to have Apple and Android options, and you know, but YouTube seems to be on everything. Uh, all the all the smart TVs. Well, what would you guys think? Uh, let us know in the comments if you think that YouTube would be a good home for the subscription. So, James Weston, that works for me, brother. Great idea. For sure, easier. Yes, sir. So I'm going to try to clip this into its own separate thing and just kind of gauge, gauge the community tab as well. We'll put up a bit of a poll. How's everyone feel? We would be able to use the YouTube channel membership function. So you'll so just be able to put up a bit of a poll. Make sure you don't dance on it, Steve. I don't know uh, if the public can deal with seeing that. I, I work out pretty hard, so it depends on the depends on the time of day. I, that might not be a terrible thing to see, unless you're not into that. I don't. <laughs> so the we also took the note from June, where we didn't looking back, we probably didn't release enough videos. So this month, July, we're going to release a lot of videos. So y'all need to be ready set and go because july 1st that is friday this friday we're recording on wednesday july 1st we're going to be doing guest booker jerry jarrett this is going to be a fun one this was a this was a great get for us um <clears throat> anyone who has watched jerry jarrett um you, you may first go to if you're going to compare Jerry Jarrett from an en entertainment factor standpoint to like a Jim Cornette or a Vince Russo, you might say, you might go to, well, maybe the delivery is a little bland. I'm saying, Listen, for me, as a mark, getting Jerry Jarrett to come on guest booker was huge, especially at the time. Um, he had just had a falling out with Jeff, and it was – all over the wrestling news that uh, Jeff and Jerry, who were partners in that early venture that would become Impact, whatever the hell it's called today, um, uh, before uh, and, and they split. And this was right at that time. Um, a, another little something for you guys like the inside stories, right? Uh, we were sharing that booking with another company who did a video. And they went first. We were to meet Jerry after the shoot and pick him up and bring him to our set, which was at a different venue. So actually, I actually can't remember the venue that we booked for this, um, but I never used it again. It was a, it was a different place. Um, I didn't like the setup. the The room was weird. Um, anyway, we go to get Jerry who's finished with this other crew and we're to pick him up at the, at the restaurant. We should probably put that in quotation marks at the <laughs> restaurant. So this Jerry fucking Jarrett, when I walk in sitting in this 
bar with pool tables and you know uh, uh, tables with with plastic coverings and like waiting for his burger um with the crew and the other people that booked him maybe it was the promoters of a, of a convention something you know that the, the the Simpsons t-shirt and blue jeans crew uh sitting around Jerry Jarrett who's in a jacket and, and the pool tables and and like waiting for fries and burgers I was like oh my god so I sat down across and I'm talking to him about the series about guest booker and we finally break him out of the prison he was in and um we get him in the car and we're driving him over. Now we walk into the hotel. We had set up at this hotel much earlier in the day, built the set, did lights done. And then that night, probably nine or 10 o'clock or whatever, after Jerry was done with the other thing, we got, we went and got him and brought him back. Now I walk into this, uh, this hotel that we're using first time I had to find it near the other venue. And there's a, a pianist playing in the lobby when we walk in. I didn't know that or plan that or what. And I hear Jerry, who's walking with the guys behind me, say, well, I don't know which operation is the high class operation here. And as I, I puffed up for him. I was like, yeah, my walk. I got a little got a little bit struck going on my way to the room. But it was a complete accident. It was I didn't know the place or what we got. And but fortunately, after he had his burger or tuna melt. Um, in the, uh, the w next to the pool table that I think the accused might have been shot there. Uh, he got to walk into somebody in a tux and tails playing a grand piano in the lobby. So that was a great memory uh, from that. Hell yeah, that was. And once again, you didn't you you don't pick the hotel necessarily based well, we on the ambiance. Like, you don't get to do a site visit, though. Like, no, no. And we had the ones we liked. There were certain things about, about the well, cost, of course, always has to come in. But for our shows, especially if we're shooting more than one thing, a big square is what we want. Anything that's nooky and turny, and that doesn't work. A big empty square is perfect. So usually a suite where the bed and all that stuff is in a separate room, but they have the big living room where I could have Craig and Brian pick up the couches and throw them into the bedroom and empty the the whole room out so that we could start from scratch and build the set and then turning it around for another show for doing a timeline and then a break in kayfabe. We have to move stuff around. So th those are the best places for us. The other thing about this show, I should say, there's two more things real quick, Steve. I, I know I'm, Please. I'm going along here. <laughs> this is going to go Broadway. We're at 618 already for Christ's sake. <laughs> the, the Jeff thing. I wasn't going to mention it because I knew it was a shoot. Um, I was fine not being that kind of shoot interview host at the time, maybe. <laughs> maybe it was before all the you shoots. I was fine just sitting him down and doing a guest booker and getting inside the creative mind of, of Jerry Jarrett. But he said during a break in the shooting, you guys aren't going to ask me about Jeff. I said, well, I didn't know you wanted to go. He goes, well, he said, the people are going to want to hear that. And I was like, oh, I forgot. I'm talking to a wrestling promoter who's always thinking about the business that we're doing together. You know, I was afraid, oh, it's step on toes. Whatever. It's not a worker. This this is a promoter who knows what to talk. I said, Jerry, that's fine with me. And so we said we actually it's a bit of a work. The the thing it, it, we made it look like it was a, it was a break in between because it really wouldn't have been appropriate for me on a guest booker to start asking him about his fractured relationship with his son. So we did it as a break where he asked for a glass of water and, you know, we hold up and I and I turn to him and I, and I begin talking about Jeff and he answers it on camera. So uh, I think that was his idea, actually, to, to make it look like it's it was an exclusive. It was something inside and the fans were getting to uh, to eavesdrop. So that was if we watch this on July. What is it? July 1st, July 1st, this Friday. That's um, that was all set up by uh, by Jerry. The second thing I said, there were two Please. things. I don't know why I, I wore eyeglasses for this shoot. I wear glasses. I wear contacts. I guess I was out of contacts. Maybe a contact fell out. I lost it. I don't remember. 
I put on eyeglasses and I did the show. Well, you would have thought, I guess there's a lot of OCD viewers and I'm not, you know, making fun of that. I'm not ribbing on you. It's, it's fine. We, we, I'm with you. I, I feel for you. But the break in their continuity where they had to watch a show of mine where I wore glasses, I got emails, comments. It became a trivia question on our message board page when we had the KC message board over at Kayfabe Memories. Um, what's the one show Sean Oliver wore eyeglasses for? It, I never intended to make it a point of discussion, um, but it was. That's the wrestling fan for you, right? The right? Similarly, I think I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to look at it specifically. I wonder who is the oldest K, who is the oldest guest of a kayfabe commentaries video. The oldest guest, uh, age wise. Yes, age wise. Sorry, at the time of recording, Bruno. Bruno, Bruno. Yeah, Bruno would feel. I was just. I felt. I put the glasses on. I felt the need to be analytical. Uh, probably in descending order, it might be Bruno, uh, George Steele. Um. He looks very good for his age, but Rick Martel, he's actually 94. Um, and uh, uh, maybe, I, I guess Jarrett might be might have been in there somewhere. At the time, this was probably, well, I don't know, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? I don't know how old he was. But Bruno was probably the, oh, well, we had Harley a few times, too. Mm. Harley and Bruno were probably around the same. Jerry Jarrett is 79 years old now. So maybe it was 69 at the time. That would be way up there. Yeah, that he'd be up there too with with Harley and uh, and Bruno. I got to tell the Harley grabbing my ball story on the uh, on a podcast last week. The uh, um, um, Jesus Christ, it's, it's late. It's late. <laughs> it's French. La Resistance. Oh, um, um, Rene Dupree. Rene Dupree's show. Sorry, Rene. It's it's it's. it's cool. I Rene Dupree. I will pay you a compliment. I think it was three weekends ago. A colleague of mine in the YouTube world sent me your YouTube page and said, wow, someone's finally reading the Steve Kaufman handbook on how to do a podcast on YouTube. So that's the, and I looked it over and they're right. Like you're actually doing clips every day, whole episodes, everything makes sense. Good thumbnails. That's a thumbs up for me. And those are kind of rare in this world. Well, it's Renee and uh, uh, James. Is James the name of the fellow that runs it with him? He's a, he's a Brit. Um, and- no, I think that's the Dutch Mantel podcast, that James. Unless, unless there's two. No, Sorry, I think James is. I think that guy's Australian. Is James? Is that James Australian? Jesus Let us Christ. know in the comments. Sorry, yeah, I sorry. thought I had a grasp on this. The guy that does the Rene, the Rene Dupree, also does the, the that '90s wrestling uh, podcast. I think it's called. I was on that once, also. A nice bloke. Very nice, nice bloke. Yeah, nice bloke. Yeah. All right, uh, but they do. They're digital. They're digital producing. Second to second to none. Yeah, maybe, their, maybe their, me. their game is strong. I saw all the, the the little thumbnails with the custom. You know, they broke out some of my comments and made them quotes. A little clickbait there. Oh, well yeah. done. You got to got to earn that click. Uh, Tony Bronco gave us uh, ten dollars Canadian just to say that he's our number one fan. You are our number one fan. Thank and you. Tony. If somebody wants to be our number one fan over top of Tony Bronco, uh, ten dollars Canadian is the number you have to beat. That's right. Um, and this James is Romero is his name, and he's from the UK. Free, I'm giving free content, right? And but yes. they're throwing money at us, literally, just for being here talking. James, I, I hope you're a trendsetter with that, right? James Romero. James uh, Romero. He, um, the channel he currently does, which is just wrestling shoot interviews. At one point, if you just like did a wayback machine on it, was once a Jim Cornette clip channel, and I don't know how much more. He'd want me to reveal beyond Is that. Is he the one that does the uh, who who does the Don Morocco? I would have to check on that. Where they literally, it appears, wake up Don and <laughs> drag him in front of the camera and pepper him with questions um, that he may or may not remember, depending on the episode, which is what makes it exciting. It looks like that was James Romero, but okay. I'm seeing I'm seeing a post from. To open it up here, June twenty eighth, so very recent, yesterday, saying this is the end of the Don Morocco podcast. But Don so, fell back asleep. I'm sorry, but, um, but it's it looks like a video of just James explaining. It's about five minute video explaining what the podcast was, probably explaining why they're not doing it anymore. Don so, didn't die or anything, did he? I I, no, Don. No, I don't around. think it's anything okay. like that. Um. All right. All right. So it's one video. It's going to be guest Booker Jerry Jarrett. I think we've talked plenty about it. 
Monday, 30, July 25 the f- minutes per video. <laughs> 20, 20 minutes per video. I now, have this an eight next o'clock one. meeting with I have an eight o'clock writing meeting with Kevin Nash. He's not going to appreciate it if I'm late. So I have a seven o'clock with Road Ducks. I think we're going to be good. Um, your your name drop wins. Um, <laughs> You're damn right. Monday, <laughs> Monday, July 4th. We have a choice for you, the viewer, <clears throat> because it can either be. Because it's 4th of July. It's got to be Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Now, the question is, do we want it to be back to the territories with Jim Cornette where they talk about Mid-South Wrestling? Or do we want it to be Timeline the History of the WWE where he talks about 1988? Mind you, SummerSlam 1988 was... Yeah, SummerSlam 1988, he was in the main event. So these are both excellent choices. And I'm just going to pull up what we have going on here. 37% 37% to 63% with only 179 votes. Uh, timeline 1988 is eking out back to the territories. Sean, mm. if you if you were voting, what would be your pick? Oh, boy. Uh, well, let me see what I can remember about each. Big fan of the Jim Cornette Back to the Territories series. Number one, because I'm a student of wrestling and I do like to learn as much as I can about the territory years. And Jim's shows were superbly researched and um, he steered the discussions perfectly. He was I, I can't I can't begin to lather the ass of of Jim Cornette as much as I'd like to about how well he did with that series. The other thing I liked about it was I got to sit down on the set and watch it. I didn't have to sit under the lights and try to be entertaining. I just got to watch as a fan. And then we would break sometimes and I could run up and give Jim notes and we would talk about a segment and where we wanted the discussion to go, anything we might have missed. There were times where after talking for an hour and a half, Jim would just listen to an answer from the guest and turn to me and say, I don't have another fucking thing to say. So, and then we'd run up and we'd have to find out where the next half hour of the show was going to go. But the timeline, though, um, a bit of a different flavor. That that we got to cover uh, exclusively WWE in the year 1988. Uh, Jim's drink of choice, I actually remember this, um, was uh, v- uh, vodka and Coke. Um, right, right into yeah. the cola bottle um i think it was off camera it's not like the honky everyone likes to talk about the you shoot number one or honky's gatorade gimmick the seat room's extra smooth right into the gatorade gimmick um you know at a certain point as you drink it and you continue to add to it it the percentages of gatorade to um extra smooth vodka or coca-cola to um vodka uh, begins to change of course, right? Because um, you're filling it with the booze. I should take this moment to point out I was dead wrong. He was not in the main event of SummerSlam '88. Just gonna correct myself there before my wreck, before I wreck myself. Well, the fans will do it for you, even if you <laughs> don't. You know that. So for my for my choice for my choice, I, I would pick I would pick the timeline if I had to sit and watch one now. Um, a, I like to watch myself thinner and with more hair. Uh, it's a bit of a time machine in, in many ways. Uh, but also, um, I just, I love the Timeline series. Um, I grew up watching that product, the WWE product. Um, and, man, it, it was uh, to be able to go inside the company in all those years um, and be taken behind the curtain was, was, is, was always a joy for me whenever I got to host a timeline from the eighties or even some of the nineties ones. Also, it was a treat. Love to, re- maybe I'll rewatch that one on the, the 4th of J- July, the 4th July. of July. So Monday. Yes. So over for those- here guys, that's, uh, that's called independence day. Now I do have a fair amount of British blood. So I call it traders day <laughs> um, myself, but uh, uh, the blokes over in the colonies uh, want to kick their heels up. Once a year, we'll let them do it, and they can do it by watching Jim Cor- uh, by watching uh, Jim Duggan on Timeline 1988. I did not know you were a redcoat, sir. Yeah, there's, there's some um, of that in there. Yeah. Okay, a 30, 30 some odd percent, but they they, okay. they kind of lob together the 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 UK, you know. So there's there's the British, so there's Irish in in there too. Yeah. 
So right now we're looking at 61% timeline, 39% back to the territories. They gave me a character limit, so I was unable to say um, Jim Cornette in that character limit. I feel like a lot of people like Jim Cornette. Both are going to be excellent choices, and it's going to be this Monday, July 4th. We're going to let you know at the end of the stream. Whoever's winning, that's who won. So July 7th. It'll be seven days into July, and we're releasing the third video. This video is actually going to get to stay up forever. It's a returning series. It's a long-lasting series, and it is wrestling's most controversial moments. I believe there are seven or eight wrestling's most in the series, and we're going to yeah. release those the first Thursday of every month, and they're going to stay up here at youtube.com slash Casey Vault. Um, Sean, how did the Wrestling's Most series come about? There was a show on VH1. It was a countdown show. They would do, I don't know, most uh, most controversial songs or whatever. And it was a, it was a countdown show uh, hosted, well, not so much hosted, but but with celebrities commenting on um, on the, the countdown, they they didn't only do music. They actually did like 80s TV show countdown and movies. So they would have uh, performers from the pop culture uh, era that they were discussing come on and do the countdown and comment on on the items that were coming up in the countdown. So we said, well let's have a let's have a, a, a wrestling one and the way we were able to do it was we would shoot because we were shooting i mean at one time at our busiest we we're doing 18 full-length shows a year i think that was the most stocked our release calendar was um so we have people coming through all the time i love the 80s thank you that yes. was uh, Salvatore threw that up there. And then that team eventually started out. They did a thing called Best Week Ever, and it was the same team. Oh, really? The, the okay. People liked that. Like I would call it their content farm, that it's like, let's do a decade show, but then let's also do just a weekly week, week in review show. Right. It's just talking heads. Like back when, right. back when a million people would watch something like that on regular TV every week. Right. So we figured let's do a half hour show. Let's do it. Or, or were they an hour? I don't know. You guys will tell me how long the uh, wrestling's most were. I think maybe they were an hour. Um, so rather than the regular two hour shows or the, the 90 minute shows, we'll do a short um, uh, one hour show where we did wrestling's most blank. So it would be uh, wrestling's most controversial moment, wrestling's most awful angle, wrestling's most awesome manager. So we, we would put it out to fans on our website and they would vote. They would get like three weeks to vote. We would direct them there. So the countdown was legit. It was entirely uh, fan driven. <clears throat> so at the end of those three weeks, whatever the results were, um, that was it. It, it. it went out and then we, we got to, to sit a talent down and do the countdown with them. And we would uh, we would do it usually after we do one of two ways after a shoot. Like, let's say we, we did a, a timeline fit Finley. Um, we would shoot the show and break, uh, change camera lighting, put up the green screen and do uh, read him the countdown and get his reactions to the countdowns. And so with fit there, we would do one whole season, which I think it was four per year. We would release one per quarter. Uh, on the calendar. So we would do the four countdown topics and have him react to the five uh, in the countdown. The other thing we would do is we often shot shows at conventions. So we would leave a day or a portion of a day with the, the wrestling's most set up in the corner. We'd be doing timelines and you shoots over here, but we had that over there. So that when we had breaks in the production schedule, like in between a U shoot and a timeline, because I didn't have enough to do that day, hmm. I, I we try to grab a talent and run them in for a half hour and shoot uh, their their countdown segment, and then they'd go out. We grab another talent and run them in, and that allowed us to get access to people that had never been on KC shows, um, like Abyss. Uh, who at one point he was doing the Joe uh, Park thing, but um, I knew he was a fan and I knew they'd never let him do a full show. So, 
but we were able to run him in and get the countdowns for him. So he was able to appear on a KC uh, countdown show. So that's how we did those. Hell yeah. The, I'm looking forward to these because I like I love, I like that. I love that talking head style, really segmented. And I think an early pitch for you that may still happen is to try and do that, but clipping stuff together from already existing episodes. Yeah, I, we always talked about that, Steve. And uh, the technology was at a different place 15 <laughs> years ago, you know. It would have been a lot to go through every show and find every time someone told a Vince McMahon story so that we could put out Casey's best of Vince stories. Um, but now we kind of can. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we are talking about, about doing that. The editing of these shows, let me just say one more thing. Um, the editing of these shows was like putting piece of classical music together i enjoyed the challenge so much and when you watch these hopefully you will uh what did you miss someone just said i came in an hour late what i miss me rambling incessantly power blind about the two shows we've announced so far <laughs> in 36 minutes um so i to edit these shows <clears throat> here's what i would do i would drag each person's complete let's do the it was the top five controversial moments right so the number five moment, let's say we had 12 talents that commented on it. I would drop Tammy's entire segment down on the timeline. Then uh, uh, Road Dog's entire segment on the uh, whoever it was. there, And then in listening to them all, I would try to find thematically funny things or or, or consistent things to put next to each other. So I clip a few sentences out here and move it here. And then I listen to, oh, here's got a couple of sentences that kind of relate to that. Let me throw it over there. So I would just, it would eventually be a hodgepodge and it would be, it would make sense in my mind, but on the timeline, it would look like a mess. I wanted it to flow like a conversation as if they were sitting in the same room and someone throws something out. And then another guy says something else that's related to that, or maybe a counterpoint to that, two funny things butting up against each other. So I hope you have an appreciation for the task that was editing the wrestling's most shows. And you can let me know as you always do <laughs> at Kayfabe Sean on Twitter. So moving along uh, the day, the next day, it'll be Friday, July 8th. <laughs> we will be airing. I I'm going to say one of the most infamous you shoots yeah. and it is you shoot number four, Jamie Dundee. Yeah. You, you mentioned last week and in your book that at the end of this, you wanted to know where he can send, where you can send him a copy of the DVD, to which his response was Jamie's mama. Mm -hmm. That was it. Just it was it was it was an Abbott, Abbott and Hardy bit where it's just Jamie's mama, Jamie's mama. Like that's not an address. So now that he's kind of turned his life around and he's a bit more public facing, do you know if Jamie Dundee's ever actually seen this interview? I don't. I don't. Um... I assume he it, it the damn thing took on a life of its own after it came out. <laughs> so I'm sure he did. I did hear through other people, never through Jamie, <clears throat> that he wanted to do another one to make up for what happened. He didn't understand that he was perfect. I, I didn't want a gentleman to come on. I wanted Jamie Dundee to come on. That and 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 he came on and uh, you know, I think he did fly home and get arrested shortly after uh, 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 landing. I think mm -hmm. I, I think we literally paid him, flew back, bought some dope and got arrested with it in the car. Um, the a couple of things about this, you know, I got to give you something for each one of them. Uh, did I tell the story last time that Sheik was filming with him upstairs? I believe so. Yeah. On a different show or now you said it here. Well, but there was there was noise that sounded like they were wrestling upstairs. Yes. I was taking a piss and through the vent in the bathroom. I hear screaming. I thought someone was getting murdered. Um, they come down and knock on the door. I open the door and I, I, I said, oh, you, you guys hear that? Yeah, we were just shooting actually right right above your room with with the Sheik. So the Iron Sheik and Jamie Dundee did a show above us. The other thing about this was. uh I got into a, a, a beef with a promoter about this booking. Um, they uh, they did something shady. I know, shocking. <laughs> uh, I booked Jamie, and 
they were a little surprised at the booking, but I had seen a show he did, I think maybe for high spots. And I said, this guy in the right setting, like a, a you shoot, this, this is going to be entertaining. So I booked him and he, the talent called me, I booked it through the promoter. That, uh, but Jamie called me to talk about the booking and he told me the amount that he was going to be given for my show by the other promoter. And it was like half of mm-hmm. what I was paying the promoter to, to, to give to Jamie. Sometimes if a promoter brings someone in and we're using them, we share the expenses, the flight, mm-hmm. the hotel, the show. So I would just cut my money to the promoter and they would pay the talent and the hotel and stuff out of that one. I actually have the quote up now. Go ahead. That is uh, my share of the expenses. Were, your share of the expenses was two hundred dollars, and they were they they were only paying him two fifty, and then pocketing four fifty. Okay. And then I believe, actually, sorry, I don't want to step on the story. No, you're scary. You're scary that you you had that uh, at your fingertips. What, <laughs> you, what? Do you know what happened in college with the goat that one night? It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't my idea. Was it in your book? I don't know. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, so that's what it was. So they, they were going to pocket the money and, and give Jamie like $200. So I told him on the phone. I said, normally I wouldn't air other people's business, but I was hot. And Jamie actually offered to go to, to, go, to go to their shoot and get a case of laryngitis right after they started filming and, and be asked to be taken off the set. I said, don't. I'm going to give you the full money out of pocket. You'll get paid. Uh, don't screw their show. We'll get them another way. You know, the, the, if you're in the business for the long haul, you'll, there's always a way to exact revenge. So those are my, the, my memories of the, oh, and I was kissed a lot on the set apparently <laughs> by, by Jamie Dundee during the show. What was he calling me? He was calling me Conan O'Brien or, or Craig Kilburn. No, he was calling I, me. Something. I think it was co- the time, time would match up that it was Conan and Brian. Yeah. I think you so. would have, he would have mistaken you for Conan. Yes. O'Brien. It happens all the time. So if the cops in Kentucky the next day had asked him what he where, what he was doing, he would have, I was on the Conan O'Brien show, sending a DVD to Jamie's mama. Right. <laughs> like, just to tie it all back in, uh, Wednesday, July 13th, the reason we're going to do this on a Wednesday is that it's his birthday, and w- it will be Breaking Kayfabe with one Sean Waltman. You mentioned on a recording with Kevin Nash recently that he likes to sit on a pillow. Other than that, how is he to work with? You know, it was funny. Walton and we had worked together before, too. And we, we sat down to shoot. I think it was his timeline. It wasn't this because we're across from each other with this. Uh, the It didn't happen on the U shoot, I don't think, which was his first show with us. But for for the timeline, he called across the room. He said, uh, he said, yo, throw me a pillow from the couch. And I was like, oh, yeah, I said, it's hard to, you know, after a couple of hours, sit in one spot. He's like, fuck that. You can't look taller than me. And he slid it under his <laughs> ass and he sat on it. So fuck you, Sean. I'm telling everybody <laughs> that story now, bitch. Um, I love Waltman. He was always great for us and just a really good guy. It's just a, a good guy. And uh, so this show, Breaking Kayfabe, this was this was the first one we ever shot. Uh no, I'm sorry. This is the first released. I believe this is Breaking Kayfabe number one. We shot New Jack first, I want to mm-hmm. say, which came out after this, I believe. Um, we don't always release them in the order we shoot them. There's, you know, if, if one shows a better, has a, is a better representation of what the series is going to be, we'll put that one out first. Happened with the timeline series. We actually shot the Don Morocco timeline first but put out the honky tonk man uh, as a release first, because it's always good luck to launch a series with honky. We did it with you shoot. Uh, I think we did it with Supercard, and uh, we, we did it with, with timeline, the whole timeline franchise. We started with the honky show. The first episode of Morocco, I know we're not talking about, but this is the Don Morocco episode kind of uh, the, the, that episode of timeline. We, we hadn't figured it out yet. There were some things that weren't clear. I wanted it to look different. I didn't want it to just be the two sitting next to each other. And you know, each show kind of has its own color scheme too. The timeline WWEs were were blue. If you look at the halo lighting and the back background, it's blue. So I, I wanted it to to pick a color. And so I, I, I'm 
they famously made fun of me for saying, what's the color of memory when I was talking to the, the set? And that, of course, became a reference forever. But we also did it on a couch. There were two episodes done on a couch, Rikishi's and this one. And Anthony, when I was editing, <laughs> described, I'm on one end of the couch. Morocco's on the other end of the couch. And uh, my business partner, Anthony, described it as the best display of gay chicken he'd ever seen on camera. With me and Don, Don with his short shorts and his his ball bag practically hanging out as I'm pinned to the other end of the couch. Um, but uh, so Waltman, Waltman's episode and New Jack's were, were flip flop from release. They were one hour shows because they were heavy. The Breaking Kayfabe series dealt with almost nothing in the ring. It, it was it was the people behind the characters um, and we did choose talent that had, um, inch, thank you, bone chip, color of memory, liquid fluid. I actually had a science student or, or a professor maybe describe to me on, I think it was on the, the thread somewhere in, in the, in the, in the, uh, YouTube. I, I did you see this it? comment that's that a liquid can be a fluid. Yeah. I, I was schooled as to why Vader was right with the liquid fluid and the mechanical mechanism. That was the other one he whipped out. Tell me that one science student mechanical mechanism. Tell me that's grammatically correct. Is it here? No, I was, just, I was telling him to, I was oh, pointing out for him yeah, to yeah. tell us in the comments. Yeah. So the Waltman show was heavy. You know, we went into issues of addiction and parenthood and, and a lot of the things that were at Joni, uh, China at the time who hadn't passed, but was in trouble. Um, so we dealt with heavy issues on breaking kayfabe. This is going to surprise people, but there was actually a second part to the breaking kayfabes that we shot in the beginning, but we never aired. After the one hour interview segment, which often went to difficult places we shot a much more lighthearted 30-minute uh, segment afterwards. They were different for each talent. The two we did, the New Jack one, <laughs> believe it or not, was a weekend update style newscast with me as the host and, and New Jack as the co-host. And I brought up issues of the day that that we had that i had some jokes for and new jack w would discuss them with me imagine colin jost and new jack doing weekend update for saturday night live we actually shot it it, it exists i don't know, maybe we'll put it up someday I, I can't believe we did it but but we did uh if we can find it yeah I have and if to... we're if we're starting our own paywall here on youtube that might be necessary. That might be good bait, right? The Sean Waltman one was someone had, I can't remember if it was him or someone on the crew or one of the workers had a picture that Brian Nobbs sent them as a rib. And it was Nobbs in the bathroom with his pants pulled down and an entire fucking beer can in his asshole. So he was at the convention. So we were going to we, we actually didn't do this because we couldn't find a, a goddamn printer in the hotel. They have a business center. It was the Crown Plaza in piece of shit Monroe, New Jersey. We wanted to print out a color picture of knobs with the can in the asshole. And the next day at the convention to send Waltman up to him on the autograph line and put the picture down to have it signed in front of the other workers and whatnot that were sitting uh, next to him at the table. That was going to be the half hour Waltman segment after his talking about addiction and, and all the uh, challenges in his life. We decided those things did not butt up well, no pun intended, against the serious 60 minute segment of New Jack and, and Waltman and whatever. Those were the only two we, we had the, the short segment planned for. Beyond that, it just became the, the regular uh, interview show. So, but you so didn't know that. I Please. did not. That that wasn't in either of your books. We're like we're not gonna. I. I do have to ask just because a couple people have asked it already. Uh, do you talk to Sean Waltman at all currently? I uh, yeah I, I sent him a t uh, when did we talk? Uh, uh, about a week ago. Okay. Um and 
does Cornette still talk to you or do you still talk with Jim? No, Cornette? we don't. Uh, the last time we talked was, uh, I, when I had my solo podcast, when I was dipping my toe in the water to learn the business, um, uh, I, I just talked with him about him coming on the show and scheduling and he was busy and it, it was just like that whole like, oh, fucking development next to me to cut the fucking tree down and shit. And, why, you know, I've just been crazy. Why don't you give me a call next week? It's better. You know, like traded messages and just never pursued it. I don't think there's heat. I hope not. I'll take a thank you uh, <laughs> at any point for, for, for doing the Travolta thing. I call it the Travolta effect when uh, Tarantino put him in... Uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. The Cornette Effect on Kayfabe Commentaries. Funny, I don't think I'll be able to pull it up, but I saw someone in the chat saying the exact opposite. Of like, do you still talk to Jim Cornette? You know he made you famous. That's was, interesting. Was what someone in the chat said, speaking of the chat. Uh, Mackenzie Lambert, keep up the awesome work. Would love to see a Renee Goulet WWF agent interview. Also, thank you for talking horror movies on my show last year. Oh, great. Yeah, I like I like to do that, that stuff. Um uh, yeah, Rene Goulet. Uh, it was called. It was a. It was a Casey investigative special. We uh, we had an umbrella called investigative specials for shows that did not fit in the you shoot guest book or timeline. We just wanted to do a one off type thing. Uh, and and Rene Goulet inside the office. It was called where we uh, when it's a life of of being a road agent in the nineties. Uh, for WWE and um, Renee gave us how the whole thing worked from what your responsibilities were at the building, uh, both working with the talent and the house and the money and reporting the money and uh, for the for the gate and, and merchandise and how it, it all worked. One of those fascinating things that, that, you know, me as a fan, and that's why I think KC was so successful that, you know, Anthony and I were first fans. And so we produced shows that we wanted to see. And um, that was one of them. Hell yeah, I was texting Road Dog, let him know. Um, so this next one, Monday, July 18th, which is Al Snow's birthday, we are going to be doing You Shoot, Al Snow. I think he's one of the smartest people in the wrestling business. He is the first person in any interview I've ever heard describe why we call people marks. That it's a, a shocking thing that like me and a bunch of magicians at a party once we were all talking about what wh why we know the word mark and it was from an al snow interview missy hyatt told uh a story on the set once uh it was the set of missy hyatt's pajama party yes we produced that if anyway it wasn't roger corman uh <laughs> or john waters it was us um she claimed that back in the day in the the brothels uh i want to say uh, where when someone came in with money and the girls would sit on his lap and throw their arm around, they would mark the back of his jacket mm -hmm. with like with, a piece of chalk or something. With and, chalk. And it started, as far as I can tell, it started in carnivals where the, the box office would be about two or three feet taller than the average person so that the actual box office attendant can look into your wallet as you grab your money. And then they can signal to another carny to mark you with a piece of chalk if you have money. Right. And then once you're in the carnival, everybody knows you're a literal mark. Do everything you can to get this mark's money. And it, in Missy's mind, it was a whorehouse. But in reality, probably it was the carnival. Well, I'm sure it started in the carnival and then moved on to whorehouses. Like it's the similar. Right. And all this and more, you shoot Al Snow. Right. They're both full of rides, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you should, yeah, Al's a smart guy and it gets some heat a lot of times. I was surprised how many people like to challenge him. A lot of fans. He does kind of take that snarky position towards a lot of fans, like you fucking marks. Kind of like his his tolerance is his, his his fuse is about that short with uh, with some of the from, from the, some of the smart fans. So I think people uh, take him to task for some of that. But um, I always liked Al. Always worked well with him. Um, I do like to 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 talk with him when when we work together, and I do find him to be a, a smart guy. And he was one of the. One of the workers that actually tried to write a comedy set, imagine that, when he was on Ring Roast 3, the uh, the roast of Jim Cornette, which you all saw here a couple of months ago. Yeah. I, this set was one of the better ones on that show. And they were all pretty good. Yeah. Uh, July 22nd, we have guest booker number six. The reason we're running it in this month is July 14th, 1984. That was Black Saturday. So 
Guest booker number six, Greg Gagne. He's going to be talking all about 1984 in the AWA. Yeah. Coinciding this, with Black, Sat- Black, Black Saturday. This, was the, this show was supposed to be Greg and Vern. So this was my second boner moment in the guest booker catalog. The first was getting Jerry Jarrett on. And then right after that, or actually my, right before, I think this was, guest, this was guest booker six, if I remember. I think uh, Jerry Jarrett was guest booker seven. Don't, re- don't I, I don't know, those weird little autistic things stay in my mind. But uh, the, uh, it was supposed to be Vern. Now, Vern was, was on shaky ground health-wise. And this was in the winter. And they got hit with a storm out in Minnesota to the point where uh, uh, Greg's flight was postponed until, well, it's, I think he got in at about one in the morning. So when you watch this, we're shooting this at probably like two or three or four in the morning through, through the, the late night hours. But um, Vern was supposed to be there. And you can look for these little something for you to look for. We shot the intro. I used to do a, a proper intro to each, each guest booker. And we shot it earlier in the day when Vern was still slated to come. So my closing line was uh, in guest booker with the Ganyas. But I had to go in and dub guest booker with Greg Ganya uh, in post-production. So it's not going to line up. I say Greg Ganya, but if you look at my lips, I'm saying the Ganyas because we thought... Uh, Vern was coming. Vern couldn't get on the plane. It was too late. It was 1130 at night in the, in the middle of a storm. Uh, Greg didn't want to risk it, but uh, Greg was able to speak to a lot of the questions we had for Vern because it covered uh, the time where Greg was there and working in the office right beside his father. Great. I'm looking forward to it. That'll be July. T- Sorry, that'll be July 22nd. July 28th, and we only have three more videos to talk about. July 28th, we are doing episode number two of Raven's Wrestler Rescue. This one is a wrestler named Dr. Acula. What do you remember of Dr. Acula? Listen, fuck all of you. I like this show. All right. <laughs> I read the comments, and it's about 50 50. It's batting about 500. I thought this was the next, this was where. This is before the network, too, I think, or the network was just putting on old matches. I thought this is where the inside wrestling content was going to go. Reality based stuff. So we had the, a makeover show with Raven where he took a worker, made them over and then sent them out. To, and we filmed the match and Raven's reaction while he's watching the match and the audience to see whether it gets over. I thought it could it could become where the shoot interview was going. Um, and I, I still think the shows stand on their own. I don't care what anybody says. You want to listen to a shoot interview? We have that. We have Honky Tonk Man sitting there, you know, shooting on everybody in the business. And, you know, we have historical shows like Guest Booker and Back to the Territories with Jim Cornette. And then we have some experimental stuff like this, the Wrestler Makeover Show, for God's sake. Thought it was going to be huge. Huge. I... <laughs> Dr. Acula, for God's sakes. Um, Edward Nevado in the chat. Shout out to Sean for making wrestlers cry. Have you, no, that only you... happened on Breaking Kayfabe. Only the one time. And like it was, no, it was, it was the was, research and the question. It was a few. It was rough. It was, that became the thing of, of, of Breaking Kayfabe. And uh, there was, it, it's probably more noteworthy to talk about the ones that didn't cry on Breaking Kayfabe. I think, uh, I think uh, Shane Douglas... Uh, escaped without a tear. I think Nash also probably has ice water in his veins. Um, but but uh, Francine was was a mess from, I, I think, the opening credits. She might have cried through uh, the first half of the show. And, you know, Waltman had... Look, they're honest moments, and that's what I want. I didn't certainly sit down and say and make people cry, but I wanted to talk about things that did not involve the ring we people go there they cheer for these people sometimes they shit on them on the internet if they only knew who these people were these wrestlers were as people um i I think it would change fan perspective a little bit so that that was the point of that show yes yes a lot of people cried on breaking cave um new jack cried right (laughs) um speaking of things worth crying about uh july 31st 2015 we sadly lost rowdy roddy piper oh 
Yeah. Timeline WWE number 18. We're going to be airing disc one on July 30th and then disc two on July 31st. Um, you mentioned in your book that you went in sixth grade, you said in your book, that you went out in Halloween as Rowdy Roddy Piper. What was it like working with a childhood hero like that? So I dressed as Roddy Piper in, yeah, I guess it was sixth grade, and I actually showed him the picture at, at one point in, in meeting Roddy. Uh, and uh, I also, my other Roddy interaction as a kid, uh, you're going to make me do this, right? So... I used to stand out back in the Meadowlands Arena and wait to see the wrestlers. I mean, I try to get autographs and get pictures, but I just wanted to see them. This was at a time when wrestlers didn't look like baseball players. They looked like, you know, the circus was in town. Yeah. So I just wanted to stand in awe of these, of these guys that I watched on, on television every week. So Piper, so the car pulls up and uh, maybe Orton's driving and Roddy's in the passenger seat. So I stick my head in. And I tell him he was wrestling Bruno San Martino that night, or maybe a tag match with Bruno and his son, some combination. So I begin to tell Roddy um, in a very inappropriate, culturally inappropriate. I am 30 percent Italian, as 23 me tells me about, you know, can you talk to the ref about the oil, about the grease that it's it's probably should be considered a, a foreign object and. Um, and Roddy turns to me and smiles and goes, you're going to take my job someday. And they drove in. That's all I needed. I could have died right there. Um, I don't know. I wonder if I even told him about that when I worked with him on Timeline. That was one of those things where, you know, when I sit down, um, it's, it's all business. And, uh, but there are times, I have to tell you, that uh, it, is, uh, it is harder to stay engaged some of it has to do with the talent that I'm talking to, but other times it has to do with the time period. There's just not enough interesting stuff going on behind the curtain and on screen when I'm doing a timeline in the 2000s. However, timeline 1984 with Roddy Piper, where I got to talk about the coconut with Snuka, uh, Frankie Williams getting smacked around on the set, and uh, Dave Wolf, Cindy Lauper. To be able to hear all this from his mouth, working with Hogan, going over the whole, I'm not jobbing to you, you're not jobbing to me, behind the scenes. And I just, it was, it was engaged. It was a double disc, and obviously it's here, it's two release dates. So the thing was probably three or three and a half hours. I probably could have done six hours with Roddy. It was that good. I was that engaged. I was not anything but a passionate fan for, for those entire three hours. And uh, yeah, 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 the Bruno thing. I'm sorry, guys. I was, you know, I was 12. I was a dick. Um, so, yeah, so so it was that it was that engaging. The other thing I'd be remiss to not mention, uh, there is a a very uh, not so veiled allusion to Roddy Piper doing something uncomfortable as a 16 year old wrestler with Pat Patterson in California. Now. I had no idea this was coming. I didn't uh, obviously write it. It just came out. I was talking about Pat as a booker. And Roddy has a very conflicted moment where he's debating whether to go into Astoria. He gives enough uh, for it to uh, for some phone calls from Connecticut to have happened. And uh, and they did uh, after that. Uh, so that was a source of great heat between Roddy and Pat throughout the 80s and as confirmation of this if you watch that legends house where they put everybody all the wrestlers together it's basically the surreal life that vh1 gimmick but with wrestlers roddy and pat are in that same season together i watched it i don't think they say two words to each other for the whole show the whole series I think you're right. Also, maybe, maybe in some group discussion, whatever, there is never a conversation between Roddy and Pat. That heat was real. Also, and that Rod show that show was recorded years before the WWE Network launched. So because they had recorded that whole show in an attempt to sell it to VH1. So otherwise, so otherwise it sat on ice until the network actually launched. Mm. So that makes it way closer to the events of this shoot interview. Right. So the heat would be even more real. Yeah. So something happened. 
I don't know what it was. Roddy references knee pads and all that stuff, but maybe, maybe there were maybe it was a shoot fight in the locker room. Who knows? Needed knee pads to take him down. Right. He, he, didn't, right. he didn't elaborate, and it wouldn't have necessarily been appropriate for you to ask him to elaborate. You weren't this wasn't this wasn't breaking kayfabe, Roddy Piper. Yeah, it, we we'd gone far enough with it, uh where uh you know, we still weren't in, in the realm of liability because Roddy didn't say uh, anything very specific. But look, he spoke specific enough. And, you know, he was claims to have been a 16 year old worker at the time. And and Roddy held a grudge uh, for whatever happened there. And I, believe- I did. I did send an email to Dave Meltzer before the release. I said, listen, just if anyone ever asks me, I'm going to need some kind of confirmation. Did you ever hear about this? And he hadn't. And he didn't know timeline wise, no pun intended, whether it worked because uh, Roddy referenced the Olympic auditorium, which would have been Los Angeles. And for the time period he's talking about, I thought Pat was just in San Francisco. But I mean, maybe he was making the rounds. I don't know. Also, because there was no clarification, it could be just heat that wasn't there are other ways for knee pads to have been implied and i believe roddy had said in other interviews after that the r word that we're all alluding to never happened so well that, that was after connecticut called him i, I do know that he was okay. called, he was called on the carpet because that legends house show was going to go on and uh he was he was reprimanded for what he said on our show so he he did change his tune a bit but Folks, on July 29th, is it? 30th and 31st. 30th and 31st, you can judge for yourself whether it looks like Roddy's uh, making it up or not. Yeah, so not to go out on that note, we still need to know what we're watching on July 4th. Sean, what do you think it'll be? Well, the, the, the timeline had, had, uh, a, uh, had really pu- been pulling ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, if territory's caught up yet, but you'll tell me and the fans. Timeline Ooh, wins. 59 to 41%. That's that's a fairly small margin, but timeline WWE 1988, which I'll own the correction, it was the Royal Rumble 1988. Jim Duggan won the fir- very first that's, Royal yes, Rumble. That's why, we, that's why we gave him that that show. Yeah, We always yes. had to choose which guest for which year, and that was why. He was he was high. He had a high profile year in, in 88 and he started it off right away in, in January. And you guys, it, you'll, it's, it's the vodka and Coca-Cola. <laughs> and Sean, thank you so much for coming by this. This was an excellent stream. I think we're going to have an excellent July. Which which of these are you most looking forward to the people seeing? Um, well, you know, the Piper show is just so special in, in so many different ways. I, I think that it was. It, it was just a great show. It was everything that timeline's supposed to be. So I think people are going to enjoy that. People talk about the Jamie Dundee thing all the time to me. So if people haven't seen that yet, you're finally going to get to see the madness. And it is madness. It is 90 minutes of madness that I stood uh, beside, sat beside him as the uh, kind of like the, 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 the wrangler in the, in the lion's cage uh, at the circus. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a great month. Uh, the, the Nash deal, I, I did tell people, I would tell everybody our, on, on, um, July 11th, click this podcast. We'll be launching our first episode is going to be entirely dedicated to Scott Hall. So it's going to be, um, Scott Hall stories, histories, things you guys never heard about. Uh, Kevin wants to do uh, a solid for Scott and, um, uh, I'm, I'm all down for it. I said, that's, it is, it is your hour and a half to, to do anything you want about Scott. So that's episode one, July 11th. Click this podcast with Kevin Nash. Episode one, Scott Hall. That sounds great. And he's Sean Oliver. I'm Steve Kaufman. And thank you so much for tuning in. And be sure to subscribe. Let us know in the comments if you want us to do partner memberships, YouTube memberships. And thanks so much.